Hello and welcome to uh, another session of the Donahue Group. Um, we're delighted to be back. They haven't kicked us off the set and so, or taken us off TV, so we think we're doing great. Uh, this is a half hour discussion of some of the issues that are of interest to us as citizens of the city and the county and the state. Uh, joining me today uh, are our trusty panelists or participants, um, whatever we want to call ourselves. We're the group. <laughs> the group. You're the Don and you were the group. <laughs> we're like Gladys Knight and the Pips. <laughs> 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 30 seconds and I'm out of control already, what can I say? But um, just to reassert my control, I'm going to introduce um, the folks sitting around here. Um, Cal Potter is uh, to the, the far right here. Um, Cal is former state senator, uh, also former assistant superintendent uh, of public instruction in uh, Madison and now retired and living a busy retired life. Tom Paneski is a professor of mathematics at uh, the University of Wisconsin Sheboygan and uh, served uh, as a, a city council alderman for 14 years, 14 I believe, years, uh, right. in, the, in the 1980s, 79 through... 93. Through 93, very good. Um, to my direct right is uh, Ken Risto. Ken is, uh, as he often tells me, a humble social studies teacher, but in S actuality is the coordinator <laughs> of uh, social studies instruction for the uh, Sheboygan Area School District. And I'm Mary Lynn Donahue. I'm a lawyer in private practice here and the, we are a diverse group of diverse opinions and different approaches to life, but the one thing we have in common is that we like to talk and we like to talk <laughs> about the body politics. So with that in mind, we're gonna get started. Um, we thought we would talk um, uh, a little bit this time about, <clears throat> for lack of a better word, the cost of government. Uh, it costs a lot of money. Uh, in the minds of lots and lots of people, it costs way too much money, and there are all sorts of moves afoot to try to curb those costs. Uh, and I thought we'd talk a little bit, uh, just as an initial piece, about TABOR, T-A-B-O-R, which is an acronym for the Taxpayer Bill of Rights. Anybody want to give a 30-second description of, of what TABOR is? And we can start the, the, the discussion from there. Well, there have been a number of uh, initiatives uh, over the years to try to control from the state level uh, spending on a local level. Um, when I first began serving in the State Assembly, Pat Lucy was governor, and Pat Lucy had, uh, we had controls on school districts that were basically inflation-based. Uh, they were uh, modified over the years to provide about 15 different exemptions and really kind of imploded as a result of their non-functionality over time. Um, in the 1990s, when the Thompson administration was in office, uh, we had controls put on for, for teachers and administrators or salaries, as well as uh, some type of revenue cap uh, to control school board uh, budget increases. So the movement has been trying to get a handle, usually on the property tax, because it is one of the major uh, visible taxes. It comes in a lump sum, uh, whereas your sales tax, your nickel and dime to death, I guess, and you don't sort of rise up against that as, as, as much. Um, so now we've had, in, in the last two sessions of the legislature, including, I'm taking this one, a movement to uh, one, freeze local budgets, and of course, when you do it through legislation, uh, the governor has a say in it. In the last session, he vetoed it and threatens to veto similar um, sort of blanket approach to local budgeting. And so the legislature is, is taking the option where you don't have to include the governor, and that's the constitutional amendment route, which if you pass something in two successive sessions of the legislature, it goes right to the electorate. So if the legislature uh, passes something this session, and again uh, in two years, in the spring two years from now, you may have something on the ballot that's the taxpayer's bill of rights, which will in essence put in, in our constitution a formula that will dictate as to what local budgets can increase. And they're usually uh, based on, and this will go through an amendment process as it's debated, but it's based on usually growth in population or growth in uh, personal income, some factor that sort of you hitch your, your star onto some other economic uh, goings on in your community or in your state. Well, I, and I think the um, uh, Frank Lassay's uh, Tabor 
proposed amendment is actually tied to new construction. Mm -hmm. So uh, again, because it's property tax uh, basics, and and if you don't have growth in your community, in value, in new businesses, in the homes con construction, you don't have uh, any base to have increased revenues. Uh, the problem, of course, is that when you get into schools, for example, um, there's another big kicker when, since the state picks up close to two-thirds of the state cost of, of education, when you have a declining enrollment, which over half of our school districts have, uh, you have subsequent uh, reductions in state aids. And if you're, in, in, when you're talking about 60 to 65 percent state pickup, and in some districts as high as 70 percent, and you have a loss of 100 kids, um, you're talking about real kick in the pants budgetarily. So when you talk about just using a factor such as home construction or property value increase, you can see a school district that may have no growth, a loss of 100 kids or whatever, if it's a small district, is really in a difficult situation. So that's why this is so hotly debated, is that these formulas that are being put forth, whether they're on personal income or property value increase, uh, are applicable to all units of government that usually level your property tax, but the players and the factors and the variables that go into whether they're workable or not are all different for those various units of government and different from community to community. It, it kind yeah. of, the, the emotion that Tabor, uh, I mean just the, the phrase Tabor now is kind of in the political consciousness and on one side or the other it's generating probably a little more heat than light uh, because it is a complex topic but why all the energy on this? Why, why all of the, the, I think, from my perspective, pretty high emotion? Well, you know, local bu budgets, I, I've always tried to tell people when I was in the public office, is that government is faced with the same cost pressures that a home owner is, a person who lives everyday life. I mean, they buy food for, uh, if you have institutions, uh, nursing homes, whatever, they buy gas or oil to heat. Uh, they buy gasoline to run buses or, or operate squad cars or whatever. So the same pressures, inflationary pressures and cost of living pressures are on government that are on everyone else. But it just so happens that people, when they're faced with those pressures, start looking at things that are causing their pocketbook to be squeezed, and they start looking at government and say, I don't like the pressure that I'm getting from this. I can do something about it because I elected an older person, I elected a state representative, I elected a whoever. Um, but I don't necessarily uh, have much say in Wisconsin Power and Light or Wisconsin Gas or, or one of the other bills that come to their doorstep. So as a result, sometimes the focal point on people's budgetary frustrations and their ability to just finance everything in their life comes down to taxes. And I think that's sort of the lightning rod. It's, it's part of democracy. It seems to be unavoidable, I guess, to have that type of scrutiny. But it is very understandable that the government increases do occur because the, they're product buyers and service buyers just like everybody else is in the society. And the taxpayer doesn't have any control yeah. other than through the voting polls or trying to influence their legislators to uh, vote a certain way to to help them with their uh, their dilemma of ever increasing taxes I want to you were we were you were framing the issue a little bit and you talked about sh the government uh, dictating some kind of uh, uh, limits on the local governments I guess they do that with the school system with revenue and from a municipality don't they have shared revenue if the municipality uh, doesn't spend as much they get so much shared revenue if they expenditure restraint program expenditure yes. restraint if yes. they spend a little more they mm -hmm. so the state government has always in some form or other tried to influence spending on the local level through various kinds of programs and Tabor I think would be just another way another uh, approach it's another that. step that's probably yeah. more restrictive is what it is yeah yeah see, see the Sheboygan area school district of course is you know all us all of us have Face these revenue caps. We've been pretty fortunate in that uh, the district recognized the formula before it went into the law and actually 
uh, was able to increase their spending just before to set up that base oh, so sure. that where other school districts got caught, you know, that's not much, most people don't know that. And the second thing is we've had up until this year pretty much you know, stable or, inclined, or increasing enrollments. And so that, that allows you to get more state aid coming in when you're looking at something, I don't know, what we're getting, about $6,000 a student, I believe, from state aid, something like mm -hmm. that. Yep. So you're looking, you're right, when you're looking at a thousand, you know, hundred students, you're looking at a, a chunk. Now this year, what might happen, our projections are we're going to stabilize a little bit and we might see a little bit of a downward drift, maybe 50, 60 students, and, and then things are going to get interesting in this district. I think the city of Sheboygan, uh, through real wise fiscal management, you know, Roger Lays and the, the group over at Central really get a pretty good, I get a lot of credit for that, and, and we manage the debt well. We, we haven't had the impacts. The city of Sheboygan people haven't seen the impacts of the QEO yet. Uh, and that, what's the uh, QEO? Well, a qualified economic offer, which is our, which is the salary cap uh, law that we face. Uh, we can't exceed uh, offering a benefit package to teachers uh, more than excess of 3.7 percent which was sort of the average rate of inflation over the last 15 years or something along those lines. Now that includes not only salaries, but salaries and benefits. And so just like everybody else in the private sector, you're looking at um, tremendous increases in, in uh, generally in healthcare. We've been able to manage those through self-insurance and through some other means. Primarily, um, there is kind of a growing perception, because I hear it at the Piggly Wiggly again, about um, public sector health care and the, the deductibles and the premiums or lack of premium payments and mm -hmm. those things. Mm -hmm. Teachers have primarily through, around Wisconsin have negotiated most of that 3.7 to go into those benefits and have taken restricted salary increases. And so from a, from a public sector kind of point, uh, point of view, this argument that, well, they've got these Cadillac health care systems or health care programs we don't have in the private sector, that's sort of a half-truth. People have made the political decision within their collective bargaining units, their unions, their associations, whatever you want to call them, um, to say we'd rather maintain our, our health care programs and benefits uh, and we'll sacrifice that down in the salary schedule. Um, in Sheboygan, last time our last contract was uh, the 3.7, something like 2.1 was, was dedicated to benefits and, 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 and only about one and a half. Which isn't bad when you consider we're living in a low inflation environment. They'll, you know, put the truth on the table. We, you, we don't see that. Um, so, so if we're thinking about extending that to uh, other government employees and other units of government, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out over time. It's like a faucet dripping. You're not going to see uh, doom and gloom the first year or two years or three years, but there may be a steady erosion uh, in certain school districts. Small school districts, rural school districts, school districts are declining enrollment, as Cal was saying, they're already struggling, mm -hmm. struggling tremendously, losing. Um, and that's what the public's going to have to decide. You know, what do they value? Um, well, and that, and that kind of, I think, really focuses for me what the discussion is, is we don't talk about why we pay taxes and if any tax level is acceptable and why taxes are always too high. Have we ever been in an environment where people have felt the taxes are just right? <laughs> you know, we just, I, I, um, the Center on Wisconsin Strategy and the Wisconsin Council on Children and Families, you know, which I think are two pretty respectable organizations, um, they talk about taxes are skyrocketing in, sh in Wisconsin as, as a myth. In fact, taxes as a, sh as a share of income are actually falling <coughs> in Wisconsin. Taxes are killing business in Wisconsin. They're saying no, Wisconsin business taxes are far below average and they're not the primary factor in business location decisions. Um, what's the deal? Let me just say one other thing. I moderated a, a discussion on Tabor uh, for the, uh, that the American Association of University Women sponsored, one of my sidelights, one of my organizations. And we had six speakers. Um, the first five were, you know, people, government people, a school board member, somebody from the LTC board, the, uh, somebody from Sheboygan County, uh, Assemblyman Van Akron, who were very articulate about how awful Tabor would be. The private sector person, you know, from the Republican Party stood up and said, I opened up my tax bill, it's too high. And it was a pretty powerful statement in spite of the five speakers that we had heard before who were very articulate about how awful Tabor is gonna be. So 
What's the deal? Well, I, you know, I spent 24 years in, in state office, and I heard from day one that Wisconsin was a tax hell and that we ought to do something about it. And uh, over the years, as your statistics show, we did substantially reduce business taxes as well as a number of other taxes, um, but you still hear the complaining. Um, I have sort of just done a little personal reflection, and I think some of it is just the conditions under which people um, live today have forced uh, their price of their government to be something that competes with a lot of other expenditures in their lives. For example, home size. Um, the 1950s, 1,100 square foot house is no longer being built uh, unless it's uh, for a very low income situation. Uh, most houses today have you know four bathrooms and three garages and are probably an average of 25, 2,600 square feet and many more. Uh, well, a house like that is going to obviously take a big chunk out of your check when you want to pay that mortgage. And when you're assessed, it's going to be very reflective of what you have purchased, a high value and high tax. And so the austere lifestyle of our parents is not there as far as home ownership. And we're talking basically here about property taxes. That, that's one factor. And I think another factor is the divorce rate has uh, become about 50% of marriages. And what you find is a number of people today um, have multiple families and multiple child support and multiple alimony and whatever. And it's very difficult when they're paying out out of their paycheck, uh, not only the cost of the car and the SUV and the boat and the house to have um, support for multiple family situations. So you find a lot of people that are very strapped financially, as is shown by record in recent years, bankruptcies. Um, and some of that is due to catastrophic medical situations. That when it happens, they can't afford to pay those bills. But those bankruptcies, I think, Sorry. are reflective of the fact that people are living on the edge financially. Hmm. And as Tom mentioned, uh, when it comes down to what the heck can I do about this severe financial plight, particularly reflective of the mailing I get in December that shows a property tax uh, of several thousands of dollars. You know, it's not uncommon for these new houses to have four or $5,000 property tax bills. That is a huge bill to get in December right before Christmas and when people, again, have multiple payments and the average credit card debt is something like $6,500. You know, it's, it's just unbelievable. I, th I, I think that's low. I think it's much higher. I, I'm living in the past. but I It mean, always was sad that those property tax bills come out just just at Christmas time. Right. I, I want to add another piece of the puzzle. My, because I teach an economics class, I have my students are my guinea pigs. And uh, one of the things they have to learn how to do is index for inflation as part of the course. You know, sure. math and sure. action, right, Tom? And Good. what I had them do is I had them go to the United States. I had them go to the U.S. Census Bureau statistics for Wisconsin, and look on, fam on, on median family income, find the, the you know richest per family in Wisconsin, and put the poorest in the line and pick the middle for median. And we were indexing for median family income from 1975 to about the year 2002, and it's virtually stagnant in Wisconsin. So the average family person family, middle family, isn't in real terms, after you adjust for all the changes in prices and wages, isn't any better off than they were 25 years ago. Mm -hmm. Now you combine that with the things that you were talking about, Cal, and you combine it to what I think is an also interesting that you were hinting at in terms of house sizes, is how we define what a middle class family is or what is normal given how the media yeah. defines it for us. Or what they expect. I mean, right, when I know, grew up, we didn't have a cable bill. Exactly. We didn't have the internet bill. You look at the bills today that only people... One car. The, so, <laughs> only one you know, car. Only one car or the cell phone bill. Cell phone yeah. bill. Yeah. When you, you combine that, exactly. Yeah, when yeah. you combine that with, a, with median family income staying virtually stagnant, and then we, we figure that middle class should look like this yeah. with VC, you know, VCRs in every other room or whatever it might be, depending on what your vision of middle class is, it's, it's awfully tough to go to the public and say, uh, we, we, want, we want any kind of money out of you. Yeah. you know, and. You've got that, and then you layer on top of that uh, um, certainly a, a media that, that has a drumbeat that taxes are too 
too high, too high, too high. It's not too surprising that, that people are real leery about government. And American culture t always is a, we're, we're schizophrenic. Taxes. Well, we're schizophrenic about America, as, of government as Americans. You know, sometimes they're us, because it's we the people, and sometimes it's them, and we hate them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, America kind of swings back and forth. And, and, and that's, that happens. On the more mundane level, uh, level you know, from a city viewpoint, uh, empty buses driving by, we're paying taxpayer money and uh, supporting empty buses. Uh, when you see somebody working on a project in the city, whether it's a repair of a sanitary sewer or parks, five or six people, one person's working, the other four or five seem to be standing around. We're paying taxes for that. Now, I don't know what they say in the school system, uh, that the, they're paying taxes for you. Maybe you've got too many secretaries or too many so sitting around. Too many administrators. We always too, have many too many administrators. <laughs> <laughs> too many administrators. Yeah. But so I said, gee, I got this tax bill, and I, I observe what's going on in my community, and it seems like we're not getting uh, any dollar or any efficiency for our dollars. Well, I mean, that's bingo. real mundane. Well, that's that kind of close <laughs> enough for government work mentality. That's the real close exactly. local level, yeah. yeah. And I do think that that is just a key piece of it is that for whatever reason, uh, and, and frankly, sitting around the school board table as I did, of the nine people there, uh, seven of them either were being paid by a governmental unit or their spouse was being paid by some governmental unit, whether it was um, the state of Wisconsin or the police department or a teacher or a teacher's aide or whatever. The, the, the scope of government, I think, has increased um, beyond when we were growing up. Um, but there's just a sense that, that it's too much, too big. Um, I don't think that's true, necessarily. Um, the services that we, that we take for granted are part of big government. But, well, let me ask you this, and I know we don't have a whole lot of time to explore this, but what about shared services? This is an issue that is going to be no doubt a, a significant one in the upcoming mayoral election. Certainly we've talked about it, in, you know, between relations between city and county. Is there any hope, any salvation in shared services? I think there's a great opportunity coming up with the building of a new police building. I mean, before you lay the plans, I mean, they may already have plans, but you could still uh, change the plans and work some shared services with the county sheriff's uh, department and the city police department. Well, talk about a revolutionary idea of I mean, having it's still only an one law enforcement it's agency. An opportunity. <laughs> it's still there, but will it happen? You know, I think there's some merit to that because we pay taxes to the county. I know that's what you said the other night. Uh, we pay about 40% of our city taxes go to the county, and that helps support the sheriff's department. And then we pay for city police services, so we pay twice because uh, we're paying a county tax to support the sheriffs, and we're paying a city tax to support the police, and we're primarily protected here in the city by the police. But boy, every municipality loves <laughs> its own policing unit. Well, Little towns <laughs> have their constables. Yeah. Um, city or the, the city of Sheboygan Falls, Plymouth, the village of Kohler, everybody has its own policing unit, and we don't want to give that up. Uh, you know, it, I mean, because it is a kind. It is, I, I think, fair to characterize a revolutionary idea to have only one law enforcement agency in the county. county. Probably will never ever happen. But just bringing it up is an interesting. How much money do you do you save? save. It's going to take a difficult uh, journey down doing away with the status quo because when you have what twelve hundred towns and how many cities and villages and four hundred twenty six school districts and. We are just rich, overly rich, I think, in Wisconsin and the number of units of government that we do have. And that goes back to a time, of course, when things were uh, decentralized and simple. Um, the old township, each township, you remember, used to have that schoolhouse and, yep. and yep. Uh, you know, you could see when you traversed your, your, your countryside and horse and buggy, uh, you couldn't go very far before you needed to have something relatively close for school or municipal uh, service purposes. But today, things have changed, but in many cases, the units of government uh, still 
are in existence and to have everybody say, well, we don't need to be here anymore is a, a very strong uh, inhibition uh, on the part of those individuals in those towns and villages and cities to, to come to realize that maybe things could be done uh, differently. Um, I think the movement is going to have to come very strongly from groups such as Chamber of Commerce and so on to say um, it isn't a matter of just high taxes. It's a matter of if we were going to start over and deliver this service, would we do it this way and should we be doing it this way in 2005? And really the, the answer is probably no. And many uh, communities, if you go around Nashville and Jacksonville, Florida and a number of places that have gone metro with their fire, with their police, mm -hmm. um, you'll find out that they didn't have the vestige in the depth of the multiple units of government that we have. And so the resistance to do away with this elected board or that elected board or this panel um, is, isn't, it, it wasn't there. Uh, so we have a lot to overcome, but it really ought to be looked at very seriously because uh, this computer age and the way we are mobile and able to move around and communicate with each other, uh, we can do things differently. Mm -hmm. But it's going to take some effort to do, get there. And, and it's interesting uh, that the impetus, the more current impetus for shared services is coming again from the business community. Business. Oh. And uh, those folks willing to fund a, a study to, to look in, into areas of economy. And my question is, what are the actual economies? We talk about shared services a lot. What is, one, what does it mean? Two, what do we save? And I think that those are... Those are issues that are, 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 really not, are really not particularly clear. And I think the interesting question will be what would happen if, and I have no idea, it would be interesting to see when the study comes down, if the financial advantages are to the city of Sheboygan, but it's, it's a wash or it actually isn't all that an advantage to the village of Kohler or the town of Sheboygan Falls, and people begin to start playing that all out and, and, and then watch what happens. Then watch what happens. And maybe the city of Sheboygan finds it's to its benefit, but but the, the rest of the county may not. We used to have two health services, a county health services yeah. and a sure. Sheboygan Health Department. That's right. Uh, it was called Blinky's Department, I right. think. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. Uh, and we the no Broad longer... The Broadfry Inspector. The Broadfry <laughs> Inspector, yeah, he was... He was in, a, in a way, he was very good because he actually protected businesses because if they ever had a, a mm -hmm. case of a salmonella or something, immediately their livelihood would be wiped out. Nobody would go there anymore. So because he was so... Uh, concerned about health and made in owners do various things. He protected him in a way, even though they complained. But we eliminated the health department because there was an alternate. Uh, the county had to pick it up by state law, and they did. And they did, and they, I think, have some really committed um, people who are really focused. I, I know a couple of those folks on keeping local eating establishments clean and so forth. So we you know, we're talking about that, you know, what is actually the role of government, and thankfully our half hour is, is done, so we can't begin to launch into that. But uh, this is a topic that we can talk about forever and that I expect will be, and I expect we'll visit it again. Thanks.